As the Morning Star came off the press last night, its front page gave the news that many of its readers had feared, but expected. The expulsion of the Star's hardline editor and deputy editor from the Communist Party. Such an event would have been unthinkable a few years ago, but it's only the latest development in a fierce battle that's been raging in the British Communist Party now for several years. The hardline pro-Soviet faction, which has found itself losing out in the party's internal battles, has found useful refuge in the Morning Star newspaper, much to the annoyance of the party leadership, which is now Euro-communist. Since the party congress 14 months ago, when Morning Star editor Tony Chater was kicked off the party executive, the party leadership has tried to install its own editors. They've not been successful because officially the Star is not actually owned by the Communist Party. On the one side of the present dispute, and occupying the party leadership, are the so-called Euro-communists, grouped around the party's monthly magazine, the widely read Marxism Today. They're critical of the Soviet Union, and believe that class struggle based solely on industrial trade unions is now outdated. They place emphasis instead on new forces such as the peace and women's movements. Their opponents, the Morning Star faction, are often described as Stalinists or fundamentalists. They're rarely critical of the Soviet Union, at least not in public, and they emphasise the importance of class struggle based on the unions. In recent weeks, the pages of the Morning Star have been the scene of bitter attacks on the Communist Party leadership, who've been accused of being opportunists, and the worst of all left-wing insults of being revisionists. Some people might argue that internal squabbles between the Communist Party and the Morning Star are of little relevance. After all, the Communist Party has fewer than 15,000 members, and the circulation of the star is only 30,000, and half of that goes to Eastern Europe. But the debate that's now raging between communists is of such fundamental importance that it's now spread to the Labour Party, and indeed, the whole of the Labour movement. A key figure is the distinguished historian Eric Hobsbawm, who's called in Marxism today for a new approach to defeat Thatcherism. We think that the main job is uh, to uh, fight this, and this can can be done, ought to be done, by a broad alliance of all sorts of forces built around, if you like, the labour movement, but not necessarily confined to them. If I may give you an example of the sort of broad alliance which you think, paradoxically, it's one run by a left-wing labour, namely the campaign to keep the Greater London Council going. Now, if British politics could be run in the way in which the campaign to defend the GLC has been run, people like me would be very satisfied. Professor Hobsbawm has been described as Neil Kinnock's favourite Marxist. Although he's only met the Labour leader twice, Hobsbawm's ideas have considerable support from those around Kinnock. But Hobsbawm also has strong critics. A few months ago, five hardline communists published this pamphlet, attacking the Marxism Today Hobsbawm approach. And in turn, the pamphlet was endorsed by Tony Benn. Ben Fine and his co-authors argue that the Hobsbawm type of broad alliance is not the way to defeat the Conservatives. Those uh, to, to the right of the Labour movement are suggesting that the most important thing is to get a unity uh, against Thatcher as far as to the right as is necessary in order to bring this about, whether it be an alliance around the centre of the Labour Party or whether indeed this includes an alliance with the, with the SDP. From my point of view, this would be a completely incorrect that it will tend to concede the popularity uh, uh, or to, to Thatcher on the one hand and also to, to, to um, uh, encourage the replacement of the Labour Party by uh, the SDP, for example. Part of the discussion revolves around the changing composition of the trades unions, the left's traditional constituency. Both sides in the argument accept the traditional Labour voter, a male working-class manual worker, is declining in numbers. The industrial working class itself, the manufacturing working class, the old-fashioned blue-collar factory worker, uh, is a declining force, not just in England, in most countries. So to that extent, the idea of a movement based primarily on the male uh, blue-collar factory worker working in vast works like Longbridge, you know, uh, is no longer uh, totally true and is likely to get less true. These are a minority and now getting to be quite a small minority population. Ben Fine argues that the loss among manual workers is compensated by increasing trade union membership and militancy among white-collar workers. 
uh, that this unionism, which has grown in the 70s, uh, has itself become politicized and um, uh, drawn into industrial conflict. I think the question we have to look at then is why it is that we've had this tremendous success in trade unionism in Britain in the 70s, and yet this hasn't led to a similar success in the uh, political sphere in terms of those trade unionists joining the Labour Party and so on and pressing for um, policies which would have made Thatcherism uh, impossible. Malcolm Rutherford at the Financial Times has written extensively on the Communist Party. He sees the two sides in the Communist debate allying with the factions in the Labour Party. Well, I think that, that, that is why the split is important for two reasons. One, you get a new uh, liberal with a small uh, L movement across the political spectrum. But also you get a new hard left, because what are those who are expelled, or the old Communist Party, the Stalinists, going to do? Now, they're not going to give up and they will find uh, quite a lot of people in the Labour Party, on the fringe of the Labour Party, who will um, support this idea of uh, extra-constitutional, uh, extra-parliamentary opposition. So how do you see the miners' strike fitting into all this, then? I think it's played uh, quite a significant role um, in accelerating uh, the split, because I think that uh, although Mr Scargill is a member of the Labour Party, and Mr McGahey, who is the... Um, Vice President of the National Union of Mine Workers is a member of the Communist Party. It's probably Mr. McGahey who would have been more likely to have gone uh, for an early settlement. And you've done that on the realistic grounds that you get what's offered now in order to fight another day. Now, the Marxism Today group, I think, clearly um, support Mr. McGahey's approach to this. It's the tactical one that you can't win everything at once, and it's silly to ask for the impossible. So they favor him, and yet there is Mr. Scargill, the Labour Party member who is seen very much by the Marxism Today wing as damaging the Labour movement. At this weekend's Communist Party executive meeting in London, which expelled the Morning Star editors, the miners' vice president, Mick McGahey, was present and voted for the expulsions. The party's problems will be aired again at a special congress this May.